Okay, I think so, it's uh, recording. Yeah. Yeah, and then I can record. Uh, so thanks a lot for having me. I, uh, I'm very happy to to talk about our work here. So what I what I um, so a bit about my background. I'm um, associate professor at the University of Amsterdam. My background is theoretical physics, and I'm I got interested over the years more and more in actually looking at data to search for signatures from from dark matter in in various ways. And, worked a lot on gamma ray data analysis and recently got interested in strong lensing image analysis which is interesting for dark matter research and we used this over the last two years as, as playground also to learn more about modern machine learning techniques and, and how to apply this to this actually pretty complicated data analysis problem and um, yeah in the process we learned a lot about what doesn't work and we learned also about what worked for our particular use case and and we are now in the situation of having a nice new analysis pipeline that solves, I think, a lot of problems that one usually runs into when, when trying to solve these kind of issues. And uh, two of the people involved in this, so Adam Coogan and um, now um, is, is also in the audience, and Noemi, I, I saw her. She's now a PhD student, just started and is also involved in this. Okay, so in the work that I present here and we'll talk about is ongoing work. There is right now an archive. Sub, uh, paper out, which was a uh, submission to a NURIPS workshop, where you can find more details and there will be more papers on this on the archive, hopefully in the next weeks and months. Okay, so um, that's about context. What you see here and on this first slide are actually uh, mock strong lensing images and their reconstructed source and I, I will get you to the point where, and I will explain how, how we did this and why we did this. So we are interested um, in understanding what dark matter is made of. Dark matter makes, we, we know from a really large number of observations that there is dark matter out in the universe and makes makes up 25% or so of the energy content and it dominates mass. Um, it's pretty consistent with being a basically boring new particle that we haven't measured yet, which has not much coupling to anything else. Um, but we have absolutely no clue what it is made of. Could be very light particles, could be extremely heavy particles, could be even macroscopic objects and so, to some extent. Um, so we are basically digging very much in the dark in all kinds of directions and trying to find interesting signatures that, that would give us an indication of what dark matter could be made of. And um, one important aspect of this is to uh, think about not only how dark matter appears today in, in observations of, for instance, galaxy rotation curves, so galaxies have, are usually dominated by, by dark matter in, in mass and not by observable matter. And this affects how stars move in these galaxies and so on. So that, that's today, but actually dark matter played a huge role in the evolution of the universe itself. And it would be hard to understand how the universe look, can look like it looks today if it wouldn't be for the effects of dark matter. And so there are what is called numeric or M-body simulations that basically uh, model how from the initial very isotropic, well, uh, mostly isotropic distribution of dark matter, the, the very nonlinear structures that we see today could have formed. So galaxies, groups of galaxies, galaxy clusters, satellite galaxies, and so on and so forth. And usually you see a time evolution from like small early times, high redshift early times to today. And you see there are initially, you see don't see it greatly, but Initially, the density fluctuations were small, actually even much, much, much smaller than what you see here. So this comes from, from the inflationary phase of the universe. Uh, that's at least the idea. And then um, the structure forms under a self-collapse of dark matter over densities, and where we end up with these halos. So these, these um, basically points between filamentary structures where galaxies would form and groups of galaxies and galaxy clusters. So this, this process here of structure formation actually is now heavily affected by what dark matter is made of or can be heavily affected. And one, play, one, one quantity that plays a role is uh, in some, what's called the temperature of dark matter, or one can think of this as temperature. That's basically how hot dark matter was when structure formation started. Um, and if the temperature of dark matter was relatively hot, particles were moving quickly and uh, this erased structure on small scales. And the effect of this is that you end up with less smaller galaxies, with less smaller objects and with more larger objects. Whereas if dark matter was very cold, then even structure density perturbations at very small scales 
survived this initial phase and they, they would have collapsed into small halos. So um, basically the number density or the number and the abundance of halos that are a bit smaller than the smallest halos that we see, which are uh, dwarf galaxies around uh, the Milky Way, for instance, uh, give information about the temperature of dark matter. And one can translate this into, into information about the mass of dark matter particles. And just to, to, to show you a plot, um, this here is the number, this is a yeah, model for the number density of uh, dark matter halos, subhalos, that are inside the halo of the uh, Milky, of our Milky Way dark matter halo. So imagine these are just smaller clumps of dark matter floating around in the uh, mostly spherical halo of dark matter around uh, our Milky Way galaxy. And you see the so Milky Way mass would be a few times 10 to the 12 solar masses. And then we would expect to have uh, yeah, numerous of, of these subhalos with masses below around 10 to the nine solar masses. And more and more, more if you go to smaller and smaller masses. Um, if dark matter is completely cold, if dark matter would have been warm or is, is warm, then the number density of these smaller halos becomes increasingly suppressed. These larger halos would be filled with stars and we would see them as individual dwarf spheroidal galaxies. So these are uh, dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way halo. These are uh, subhalos around the Milky Way. Uh, but the smaller masses, the smaller, the smaller halos wouldn't harbor any stars. They wouldn't would be too small to trigger star formation. And those are basically invisible optically. But we could detect, if we could detect them, we would learn a lot about the, the mass of dark matter. And one way, there are several ways to do this. So one can look for the gravitational effects of those small objects that are otherwise invisible. And one way to do this is to look at um, strong gravitational lensing effects. So the idea is here um, to, yeah, the idea is here to exploit the gravitational effects, the, the, just the mass of these objects directly. Okay, so the, you, you see here one, of this um, iconic example for a strong lensing, what you see in the middle is a red galaxy, elliptical galaxy. Uh, and then you see a blue galaxy that happens to be just behind, well, not just, but it happens to be beyond or behind that red galaxy. So it's on the same line of sight, basically. Uh, if you think of, of the line connecting the blue galaxy and us as observer, then the red galaxy would be along the line of sight. And, uh, this red galaxy is very massive um, due to, to its dark matter content and the, due to that effect you, you get gravitational lensing. Uh, so the light from this blue background galaxy is, is uh, distorted and deflected so that in the end you see a ring. And depending on the alignment of the systems and the details of the mass distribution, you can get anything between multiple projections, and multiple images of the same object and a perfect ring. Okay. So what, what one can do with this ring now is first you can you can use this ring here, the radius of this ring to, to estimate the mass of the um, red galaxy inside that ring. Um, that's not that interesting by itself, uh, at least for us. What, what's interesting for us that if there are no small clumps of dark matter uh, in that red galaxy, this dark matter halo, this would induce tiny variations in this uh, in the image of this blue galaxy. Uh, tiny meaning typically at the percent level. And this is what we are looking for. So we are basically looking for tiny variations in these strongly lensed images in order to look for substructure. So just to visualize this again, um, I have to look at the time also. Um, so this this year is a would be the red galaxy. This year would be the blue background galaxy. This year is Earth, and the light from the background galaxy would be gravitationally distorted, reach us, appear as a ring. But then um, also lots of additional little dark matter halos that wouldn't show up as bright as you see here, but it wouldn't show up at all, would affect actually the image and, and would lead to small distortions. And so that, that's what you're interested in. It's relatively easy, easy to, once you know how the background galaxy looks, once you know how the dark matter distribution of the lens looks, it's very easy to calculate how the image should look like. The problem is simply that we only usually have these images and we have to work backward to understand how the original galaxy looked like 
where the dark matter is distributed and also how much the central galaxy that you see in the middle would contaminate the entire process and, and other things. So you, you see a real strong lensed images are actually pretty complicated. <laughs> you have lots of additional stuff in the images that, that might affect the result. So our goal was to, to figure out whether, yeah, the goal, scientific goal is to constrain the mass of dark matter particles by constraining the amount of dark matter substructure in those images. And interrupt me if you have any questions, um, because I guess if you if you see this the first time, which I think is probably the case for most of you, that, that can be quite confusing. Um, okay, so we're interested in looking for small, very specific, predictable distortions in those images. Um, and okay, one of the problem is, problems is we are not interested in individual substructure, but kind of the combined effect of all these subhalos on the image. And people have tried or started using neural networks in that context. And I think the first paper on this was by Bremer uh, et al. 2019. Um, very nice paper where they use, um, where they train, um, where, where they basically, yeah, they use uh, simulator-based inference. And I think they used also yeah. ratio estimation as we use now in this initial paper, a neural ratio estimation. Um, but what they basically do is they generate these mock images as you can see here, um, these are kind of toy mock images in the sense that they don't have all the complexity of real images. The background source is relatively simple. Uh, the main lens is relatively simple and so on. So they, they concentrate purely on the statistical problem. And then they generate different images. What you don't see here is the, the effect of the substructure. You only see like the, the main ring. The substructure we're interested in causes distortions in these images at the some somewhat like percent level. So they then train the network on being able on, on recognizing substructure in these images and are able to reconstruct the, the parameters that describe the substructure. So th this is the amount of substructure of subhalos and beta corresponds to um, how much sub larger subhalos you have compared to smaller subhalos. Um, so here they clearly show that you can train neural networks uh, for parameter regression and, and estimating posteriors in this context. For us, the, the main question, for me, the main point where, where we got, yeah. For us, the main question at that point when the paper came out was to understand whether we can apply this method also to, to real and complex images, which are, as I have shown you, much, much more complicated as, as you see here. So the, sorry for jumping back and forth. So. As you can see here, um, just as an example, uh, th this is a toy uh, image basically generated with our uh, pipeline. We, we use their background galaxy, some, some random galaxy image, lens it, and then uh, let a little extra subhalo jump around in the image. You can see it, it's, it's this red dot here, and this red dot represents an extended halo. And you see, if, as it jumps around, the image is slightly affected, right? But the effect is really small. Basically, the, the ring gets slightly distorted. And that's actually a relatively large subhalo. So in, in practice, the effects are often much smaller than this. So the problem is we have these very small effects we are looking for. But then we have this, in reality, huge variety of different strong lensing systems, which we want to analyze. And if you really wanted to use a neural net, trained on those images to tell you something about substructure. Uh, the naive approach of training neural net to be able to analyze each and every images equally well would be extraordinarily hard. I guess with infinite amount of training data, you could train a single network to be able to interpret any possible uh, strong lensing image, but that, that's not the approach that, that we took in the end. So, um, I will come to that. So our goal was to figure out a way how to use those methods for performing precision analysis of specific strong lensing images. And the way we, we ended up doing it after lots of trial and error was to uh, basically split the problem in two parts. One is to first fit the image with variational inference and then use the fit to generate training data for inference networks that tell us something about posteriors we are interested in. And that's what I'm, I'm gonna talk now about in some detail. Yes. Other questions? Yeah, uh, what precisely do you mean by a precision analysis? Yeah, that's very uh, loosely defined. What I simply mean is um, we, we are looking for an extremely small effect in high variance images. 
uh, I, I guess that, that that's what I would call this. So each okay. of these images looks completely different, but for, e in, for each of these cases, we are interested basically in percent level distortions of those images, uh, given a specific stimulator model. Um, so that, that yeah, that, that's what I mean. In fact, the problem sounds really difficult. Uh, miss, miss, you have basically two unknown systems, like the the galaxy behind the lens and the lens itself. Yeah. Um, this typically is tackled um, by making assumptions, <laughs> partially a lot and strong assumptions, um, such right. that, yeah. that the that the problem gets easier to handle. Yeah. What what can you do with that respect? Um, I, I will come to those assumptions. So, I mean, I can tell you already now, basically we model the source as a Gaussian process. and We model the, the lens right now as a relatively simple analytical low dimensional model uh, and, and want to go on from there. But, but the, the, the kind of logic behind this in principle, we want to have a prior for the source image that is, uh, that is uh, guided by how real galaxies look, right? Most galaxies that we see actually are not lensed, so we can use them to, to have a good idea of how real galaxies look like. And we have also models for how dark matter is typically distributed from numerical simulations. So we can use these as priors in analyzing the image. And without those priors, that's a completely hopeless problem. You, you get basically arbitrary nonsense. Um, so part of solving the problem is figuring out how to build tractable models, I guess, uh, that that represent real, realistic galaxy distributions and dark matter distribution. But I, I will go, get to that, how, how we do it in practice. Um, okay, so that, then there is a part that's probably super familiar to all of you. Um, so just as a reminder, I left the slides in. So we want to solve the, the inverse problem, obviously. So uh, we, we have in principle, what, what we have is we have a simulator. So we have uh, lots of model parameters. I will describe them in a second. And then a forward model that tells us how the data looks, as, how the images would look like in that case. So the parameters would include details about the lens, details about the source. And we have priors that are ideally all physics motivated. So about how we galaxies look like, how the dark matter distribution is supposed to look like. And we want to get the posterior um, using Bayes theorem, but of course not the full joint posterior for like tens of thousands of parameters, but the marginal posterior typically for something just like as a dark matter mass. And um, so the parameters that we have in our model would be parameters that describe the main lens. And in our case, right now, these are, I think, about 10 parameters. So it's a relatively simple model of elliptically shaped uh, dark matter distribution in the lens. Uh, then we have a source model. These are around 10,000 parameters or so. And then we have substructure. That, that's all the halo, small dark matter halos that sit still, that are part of the main lens, but that we model separately. And right now, these are just a few parameters, but in principle, this also can be thousands. And then what we want to do is we want to uh, take our prior idea of what the temperature of dark matter is or the mass of dark matter. And then we have a physics model that tells us basically these numerical simulations, how the substructure would be distributed for a given dark matter temperature. We have a model for how galaxies look like. We have a model how the overall typically lens dark matter halo looks like. And they want, then we want to marginalize over all of this. And of course, doing this like naively, I mean, whatever. I mean, doing this is hard because of the curse of dimensionality. Typically we have tens or hundreds of thousands of parameters and also because the, the joint posterior is highly multimodal. So with I don't know, huge number of modes. Christoph? Yeah. Can I, can I ask a question? So sure. uh, you also take um, the, distribu the, the distribution of the galaxies in the background into account, right? In this uh, model. Yeah, but in a very simple way in terms of, of just, we basically model them as a Gaussian process. Um, so it's uh, not really motivated by real galaxy images right now because we, we tried this initially using variational autoencoders but it turned out that Gaussian processes are just way more flexible and, and useful in this context. Okay. Uh, are we talking now about the, the lensing galaxy or the background galaxy? Ah, uh, sorry, I, I was talking about the background galaxy. Right? Yeah, me too. 
So, but why don't you just use images? You just take telescope images and you use those as a... Because they never looked like the galaxy. I mean, the, the, the problem is the images are really high quality. So when you, you can't just, and no galaxy looks the same, right? So uh, the galaxy behind the, the lens is a unique thing. And the only way to model the image properly is to get that galaxy. Uh, no, right. I'm sorry, I meant uh, the back for the background for just, but I guess there is. No, I, I think we, so we are talking about this, the galaxy that gets lensed into this okay. thing, here, right? No, I just wonder if there are backgrounds effect, right? Because there could be other galaxies behind or in between. Yeah, 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 that's true. We, we are not yet there. So <laughs> that, that might become relevant uh, soon because we started like looking at real data and see how, how I mean, the deficiencies of our model, but um, that's kind of the next step. And then I agree, then having actually real galaxy distributions and ideas about densities of foreground objects and so on is super helpful. But we haven't included it yet. So and and I guess for the lensed galaxy, it could actually be interesting to have a proper uh, like generative model. You said that you tried with Viles, but uh, for the lensed galaxy, for the source galaxy, you say? Uh, you for know? the so, uh, yeah, for the source galaxy. Yeah. It would be great to have a generative model. What we tried in the past, and this was our first attempt to do something with machine learning in this context, was to train a variational autoencoder uh, on real galaxy images, and then use the decoder part as like our galaxy model. So we basically had then a, I think up to like 64 dimensional latent space. And then we had a 64 dimensional model for how galaxies could look like and put this as input. But this was never very satisfactory uh, simply because you always could see that actually the fit isn't good as soon as you make the data good enough, which is not a surprise, right? If, if the mm. data, if the error bars go down at some point you will see that your 64 dimensional model is just not describing reality. Mm then um, a Gaussian process works way better because it's so flexible. Okay, yeah. maybe we can also combine the two. Uh, uh... Yeah, I think this would make sense. Um, so I mean, the, yes. for example, you can learn mean mean and covariance of the Gaussian process if you want to have a... a I think it would be process. very useful to have this as prior for the Gaussian process in some way, yeah, and, and to start analyzing images. But um, we, we are now running into other problems that are, that that are wouldn't be solved by going in that direction, which however require probably making the model anyway more complex. So, so usually the prior distribution is not that much of an issue, I would say for Gaussian processes, simply because the data is so crisp, clear, crisp, whatever. So, so clear that the data enough uh, is enough to, to constrain the few hyperparameters that we have to introduce. So, uh, can, can I ask one question here as well? But yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just um, pushing more on how complex the problem seems. But um, when you talk about trying to generate um, uh, some kind of estimate of how the prior of, of your, your source galaxies might look, surely since we're looking at galaxies lensed by other galaxies, the source galaxies are actually further or much further yeah. away than a lot of the data that we get on galaxies and therefore they're younger galaxies. Yeah. So yeah. there's also a problem there in terms of data, right? As far as I understand. Yeah, I completely agree. But since 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 we don't actually use any physics input right now for a Gaussian process, but just a Gaussian process that, that yeah, I, play I, I guess also yeah, you have the prior physics right. You kind of have some idea of how the evolution of the gap of younger yeah yeah yeah. Look, so I mean place that, 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 that's all true and a very good point. It was also our starting point kind of of thinking about let let's try to get better priors for the original galaxies. But as as far as I have seen now that's really not the problem. In some sense, the data is enough to tell you very clearly how the background galaxy looks, okay. given some lens model. The, the problem is uh, then more shifted towards um, getting the lens model correct and getting all other aspects correct. So there, there are lots of complexities of real data analysis that I haven't even touched. Like Yeah, yeah it's just a challenging problem in the end. It's, it's super cool, but yeah, thanks, yeah. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> No, but, but what you say is, is was brought up a lot of astronomers that we talked to. So how because yeah, it's it's very hard to to know how the background galaxies look. You use I mean it's pretty cool in the sense that in, in some sense the lens helps you to look at galaxies you couldn't otherwise see because it magnifies quite drastically these these galaxies. So in, in some sense you look look at unique galaxies that otherwise wouldn't be accessible in many cases. Ah, cool. Um, but for us, the, those background images are just kind of a, a nuisance parameter we want to get rid of. 
Yeah. Uh, so modern lesson learning, learning techniques, how, how do they help? Well, we, I, I said already, we split the problem up in two, right? So we have this prefit, we use variation inference for that, which is something that is basically largely unknown in, in our community. So certainly for image analysis problems in, in high, ast high energy astrophysics, that doesn't exist, but it's super useful as it turns out. And then uh, the second part is likely free and kind of a, a in some sense, a modern version of approximate Bayesian computation. So we use their simulator based neural inference. And in some way you can think about this as like reverse and, and forward KL divergence, I guess. But we, we only use like real KL divergence for, for variation inference elbow. For the simulator based neural inference, we use uh, now neural ratio estimation, but I, I come to that in a second. Or not in a second, but soon. So, okay, first step is variation inference. So the, the goal is here to reconstruct the main lens and the source parameters. And let me now just jump back a bit. Uh, so what we do there is we neglect entirely all substructure and we, because we assume, okay, it's a small effect, just percent level. And we try to get a good fit to the, to the remaining parameters. The remaining parameters are like 10,000, but at least we, we can set up the problem so that it's reasonably unimodal. So it's not exactly unimodal, but the, the other modes are kind of obviously wrong. So um, we can use relatively simple variation and inference technique to, to, to get results there. Okay, I, I assume you all know the story. So we want to optimize, uh, we minimize uh, kullback leipler divergence uh, to get a good fit. And um, we use elbow maximization for that, which, which is a fantastic thing to do. And what of course this, this helps you with is to get a good fit to the data. So this is kind of a traditional thing, just chi-square fit in some sense, or would be the classical analog. Uh, analog. Um, but then we automatically avoid also, that this should go to here, I guess. So we are, uh, automatically uh, also include, um, or we avoid overfitting by having this entropy uh, penalty term. And so what, what we do is basically we, or what we did was to put ourselves in a situation where we can use variational inference for strong lensing image analysis. And um, just as a reminder, so the, the idea is we have these kind of observations, it's called a true observation, but it's actually a mock observation, still relatively simple, that we generated based on this true source, that's a random source from from uh, a random galaxy uh, that we then lens here with our model. And we want to get back the true source or the, the, the information about the source, as well as information about the main halo that lenses this, this uh, source. And this, you can already see here how one of our results typically looks like. Um, so, so that's the goal. And what we basically did in order to do this is to uh, put everything into PyTorch. So as you know, to, to optimize elbow efficiently, it's good to use this parameterization trick and have out every, the, the, the forward model differentiable. And um, so what we did is we basically put the entire lensing physics simulator into PyTorch and then it's, it's differentiable. So, um, and it's GPU accelerated. And, and so that kind of solved that problem. And we can then use variational inference. Um, just about the model again. So we have the source plane where we put the source model with its 10,000 parameters, roughly speaking, or 100,000, depending on the situation. And then we have the image plane where the, um, or we have the lens plane where the lens is sitting. And um, right now the lens model has about 10 parameters. So it's relatively simple, um, but the goal is to make this also more complex if necessary soon. And um, right, so we want to reconstruct all those parameters with some error bars um, using most, not always mean field, but we, we use some mean field approximations in the process. Okay, so we have to model the, the source, right? So, and we, we at some point ended up trying it, to do it as a Gaussian process. Um, and of course there are quite a few libraries based on PyTorch, like GPyTorch or also other libraries that do Gaussian process regression, right? The, our problem was that none of these libraries was like fast enough for, for our purpose because for, for two reasons, I guess. One is um, the log determinant evaluation that you have to do all the, all the time to, to get like hyperparameters optimized. Um, that's extremely slow and basically kills the entire approach. And the other problem, related problem was that the number of parameters that we have uh, 
for the source model that you have to introduce is basically the number of pixels in some sense. Um, so the internal number of, of parameters that need to be optimized for the Gaussian process is the number of pixels. And that can be easily, yeah, 10,000 or more. So this basically made it not or made it very difficult to use any existing approach. Another problem is that effectively for us, the Gaussian process kernel is stationary in the source plane. So we can use their Gaussian or whatever, but we have to analyze data in the image plane where basically the, the kernel suddenly becomes distorted by the lensing and then it becomes a huge mess. So um, that didn't work. And what we tried doing is in the end, kind of the simpler version of Gaussian process. So what we technically do is, um, is how is this called? It's basis function regression um, with variational inference, which turns into Gaussian, Gaussian process regression in the end. But I think it's, yeah, the, the correct term would be probably basis function regression where we use uh, motivate, that, that we set up such that the covariance structure of what we fit happens to be a Ga the Gaussian process we are interested in. So the way we do this, okay, the, the, just to visualize the problem again. Um, so imagine we have here the image pixels right now and just in 1D, the problem is that pixel is far away from this pixel, but they are correlated because after being affected by the lens, they kind of map on the same part of the source plane, right? They don't have necessary, if they overlap anyway, they would be correlated because the flux would come from the same region. But even if they are just like nearby, if the Gaussian process that we use to, to model the source has a long, large correlation length, uh, the flux would be correlated. So, so that, that's the situation. And we have to kind of get an approximate idea of how the covariance matrix looks like for this in the image plane. So how the, the way we did this was to, um, Okay, so now, now the trick that we use to make this fast, which is basically this, this idea of using a basis function regression, is we, we kind of put ourselves in a situation where we can factorize the covariance matrix. And we, we found a way to approximately factorize it. Um, it's, it's not Cholesky decomposition, so it's not triangular or whatever, it's just uh, factorization. And then one can model the entire Gaussian process just as a basis function regression problem. So that's that's the flux in the individual image pixels. These are just our, our three parameters that we all put make standard normal distributed. And then we have and then we have the basis functions. And if if they if if the basis functions have this behave this this like feature uh, and they like multiply to the correct covariance matrix, we, we are done. We kind of have a Gaussian reformulated the Gaussian process in terms of something that we can solve with, with variational inference. And so the way we did this is to, um, is to so formally what one would have to do is to, for, to basically, or formally uh, the covariance matrix is given by the kernel in the source plane. So this would be stationary Gaussian and then indicator functions that are one in the pixels, in the projected pixels. So that would be one if you happen to be here inside those pixels and that are out zero otherwise. And so, so th this kind of thing tells you what would be the accurate definition of the covariance uh, matrix. But this is something that would be first hard to calculate because you have all these projected pixels with their complicated boundaries that you would have integrate over. And it would be hard to factorize after, after you have it because, and it would be hard to store because it's a dense, dense huge matrix. So what, what we do is we assume these indicator, we approximate these indicator functions as Gaussians. And then this becomes Gaussian times Gaussian times Gaussian. And you can kind of split the integral by just cutting this Gaussian into two and uh, get approximate expressions for, for, the, for the basis functions. And that, that works pretty well um, and does, does the job. And um, good. So then, then we have a model that we can fit with like 10 minutes of, of time or whatever. So I don't know if it's better now, no, any, but uh, it doesn't take too long to fit these models. And this here is again, one of our toy scenario um, images. And this is a fit which kind of looks like a smooth version of this. And these are typical residuals that we end up with. So you can always see that uh, it's harder to get the fit right in regions that happen to be extremely magnified, which, which are here along this, this um, arc. Uh, but usually it works pretty well. Um, 
Good, so we can fit those images and we can also reconstruct the sources as you can see. Um, this here is the, the actual true source image. Um, this is the fitted source. And on top of just getting the fit, we also get now the uncertainties of the fit, which is pretty cool. So that, that's nothing that you get from any other method that I'm aware of. So that, that is nice. And actually what we do, we don't use just one Gaussian process, but we use several Gaussian processes just on top of each other with different correlation lengths. And uh, the free parameter in our case is just the, the variance of each component. It turns out that let, also letting the correlation length freely varying screws everything up. So that this was a, a thing that converged for us quickly and is easy to, to work with. So we fixed the correlation length to on a grid to, to various values that make sense for us. And then have some component that takes care of the large scale structure, some component of the smaller and smaller and smaller scales. And again, so that, so that nicely works. And if you sum up these, these four images, you should end up with this here. So that, that's cool. And um, it works. It works also on uh, galaxies that look like fun. Uh, so these are just other extreme galaxy images that we took because they are extreme. Um, we used them to generate mock observations that we then reproduced. And you see here, that's the true source image. They are all very, very different, and we can usually reconstruct them reasonably well. Um, so that works great. Um, now the problem, okay, that solves like for the first part of the problem. Now we have like reconstructed the source and we have reconstructed the main part of the lens. And uh, now the, the second part of the problem is we have to say something about subhalos. And the goal is there, we are not yet there, but the goal is there to say something not about one, but all the subhalos in the system. And they can, let's say there are 40 in the system. One of the problems is, is that the, the subhalos are labeling invariant. So if we just per swap two subhalos, we get the same configuration in some sense, the same image. So if you think about a, a high dimensional joint posterior, it would have a very large number of modes. So in this case, 40 factorial. And so of course, I, using variation inference in that context to, to explore the joint posterior would be very, very hard to do. However, what, what comes to the rescue is their simulator-based inference because um, you can directly marginalize out their parameters that you are not interested in by, by just ignoring them, basically. Um, so the, the strategy is now uh, to, to prefit the image, then get uh, ideas about the main lens and the source and there's uncertainties and then use those values with the error bars to generate training data that ideally uh, encapsulates or envelopes the, the true observation. So generate training data for a neural net inference network and include here then also the effects, the tiny effects of substructure. And then we kind of reduce the variance of the training data quite a lot for training an infer inference network and make it much easier to be sensitive to these tiny perturbations. And then we train a network and we want to get posteriors. And um, I'm now doing this a bit fast. You can ask questions also afterwards. So the, the step so, is, uh, yeah, please. In this case, the posterior will be the posterior over the temperature. Uh, no, so we are not yet there, unfortunately. So right now we just made it work for individual subhalos, which is kind of boring because you could use traditional techniques for this as well. But this was our first test. So if you add a single subhalo, then it works. But there's no limitation in the method, or nothing in the method cares about whether you used a single subhalo or like an entire population. Um, okay, so our simulation, that, that's just the same in, in like equations. So what I described, I would skip the slide. Um, Okay, so our goal is to get in the end, not just, I mean, we want to train an inference network, but we don't just want to have a guess for where the subhalo probably is, but we want to get the full Bayesian posterior uh, for the simple reason that we care about posteriors and also that the posterior might be multimodal. And then we want to see the multiple modes and stuff like that. Um, good, so there are various ways to do this. Um, the one that we ended up using is uh, what is called in the literature a uh, neural ratio estimation or also known, uh, known as uh, AALR. Um, so it's, it was first introduced by uh, Jeloub, uh, sorry, yeah, Jeloub, uh, Yuri Hermans, and that was the third person on that paper, 2019. Um, 
And, and I will just describe here the logic behind this. Um, so it's surprisingly simple and works surprisingly well. Um, we, we tried a lot of other approaches that were harder to make work in this context. Um, good, so the idea is simply, we, we turn the entire problem of posterior estimation into a binary uh, classification problem. And, and the, the, the way to do this is to look at two classes uh, of, of uh, or two, two scenarios, two hypotheses. Uh, H not and H one, H uh, not basically is the hypothesis that a specific p image, specific observation, and a specific uh, piece of parameters, a specific set of parameters is drawn from the joint distribution. So the idea is sim simply in our case we would draw uh, a random position of the subhalo, maybe a random mass of the subhalo from our prior distribution, put this into the simulator network, and generate a random image uh, that looks dark. Sorry. Like, like this year, um, like this year, uh, with, with randomized variations of the source, with randomized variations of the main lens and with this specific position of the subhalo. And we can do this like 10,000 times, then we have lots of matching pairs. And then we can randomly scramble those pairs up and then we have effectively samples for the second hypothesis, which is that data and uh, parameters are drawn marginally, so independently. And then we just train a, a network on discriminating both cases. And um, so we, the, the goal is to get a um, classification network, I guess, that spits out the probability that the input parameters belong to the one or the other class. And one can do this um, using um, binary cross entropy. That's, that's how, how it was originally done and how we do it. I think there are probably other cross functions that one could, could use in this context, but that's the one we use. And one can then analytically show basically that if everything goes well, you end up with a, a optimal, optimal Bayesian classifier, I think it's called. And um, it's easy to reformulate this into the things we are interested in, either into uh, the, 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 the marginal likelihood to evidence ratio or the posterior to prior ratio. And from the perspective of somebody who, who messed around with MCMC over large parameter spaces for many, many, many years, this looks a bit like magic that you can directly jump to, to the conclusion to like the marginal posterior. Um, but, but this is how the method works and how other uh, simulator based inference methods work and, and also started working for us. So that, that's one of the examples, actually a couple of months old now. Uh, where we can reconstruct uh, the position of, of subhalos pretty well. So first on training or validation data, also on trust data that, that the network has ever seen. And most crucially, and this was a pretty non-trivial test, also on kind of real mock observations. Both training and validation data and test data, all, all these data sets are based on our fitted Gaussian process model, right? So we first fit our the first step, we fit a model with a Gaussian process and we use this to generate training data. So it's kind of not so, no surprise that it works on, on that data set because we generated it ourselves. But it also works on data, in this case here, uh, that we didn't generate based on the Gaussian process, but that was generated on the original, based on the original galaxy image that we used to generate the image that we afterwards fit in our pipeline. So, so we can basically go all the way back to, to real observations and get answers. And this is not representative of like what we're doing right now, because right now we are busy with writing a bunch of papers about the first part of the analysis pipeline, but it, it kind of, it, it starts working and that's pretty nice. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it seems to be similar or seems to be as sensitive ideally as a full likelihood analysis. We haven't tested this fully yet, but um, we, we can get pretty good accurate uh, precision if we train long enough. But of course, this year is way more flexible because now it doesn't matter whether this one or three parameters we, we optimize, we, we, re, we try to infer are related to a single subhalo position or entire population and para population parameters. So the goal is to now use this to actually look for, for entire populations. And that's so just advertisement, but maybe I could. So we are also writing a package that, that incorporates this idea of neural nested posterior estimation and, and try to use this for all kinds of interesting science problems. So gravitational waves, gamma ray data, uh, stellar streams, uh, whatnot. Um, I jump over this. So these are my conclusions. Gravitationally strong lensed 
Galaxy images are extremely useful to study dark matter, substructure of dark matter, small halos, and, and learn something about the dark matter mass. The problem is really to extract sub percent, basically information at the sub percent level. And we ended up um, with this two step analysis pipeline where we first use variational inference and then targeted inference networks to analyze images. Um, and it, it starts to work. I think this, the, a kind of uh, approach like this can be useful for all kinds of image analysis problems, where, where you have like a forward model that is just very complex and hard to to um, to treat or uh, to yeah, to analyze with traditional inference methods. So there is actually quite a bit of, of spin-off work um, of like using the same approach to to other data sets. Okay, that's what I had to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. So uh, maybe I will start with a question. Uh, I just wonder, so now you introduce a lot of very interesting machine learning methods and variational methods, which unfortunately each of which comes with possible pitfalls. And I wonder, I, I think it would be quite a long road to convince astrophysicists on the reliability of the whole analysis, even uh, in the sense that the problem I see is that it's a bit difficult to actually quantify to, to do a rigorous statistic analysis since all the inference are non-convex. Uh, so how do you see the process of actually convincing the communities that those methods are actually a reliable way of yeah, and I don't have the impression that necessarily the methods that are used up to now are, are uh, by themselves more convincing. I mean, usually the way you convince, I, I mean, I can tell you how I would convince myself, right? I don't know how I get others convinced. I, I first have to convince myself. Uh, so how I would convince myself is um, the method has to work first on um, on our own generated mock data, right? So we want to be able to use complicated galaxies um, uh, images and then run this through our analysis, uh, generate mock data with sub halos in this, run this through the pipeline and get reliable results. Reliable in terms of coverage, for instance. Um, so so we, we would like to, to have frequently the right answer um, giving input data that is not directly related to the pipeline. The pipeline doesn't really play a role. And then only the input data that we model plays a role and whether the outcome like has the correct coverage. That, that's step one. Um, and, and we just started looking into that, um, but that has to work first. Then the second step is um, the pipeline has to be robust. Even if you if you put in slight distortions um, with respect to, for instance, our dark meta halo model, then what, what the pipeline knows about, you should still get the right answer. If this doesn't work, one has to make the model a bit more complex. Uh, then this entire the entire story becomes more difficult. Um, but this will broaden up posteriors in some extent. Um, then, if this works, there is still the problem that that the and if if reality would look then as the simulator that we use. Uh, so Einstein rings would be just Einstein rings. There wouldn't be anything in the middle. There wouldn't be any instrumental problems. There wouldn't be any foreground contamination. Then I think this is enough. I mean, this is a, as good as it gets, right? If you have a pipeline, if you have a, if you have a model, if you have observations, it, it works on based on your simulated model, then and uh, then um, it's, there, there's not much that you can do beyond testing that making the model more complex doesn't affect results in some sense. And this is, how, I think, also how other pipelines would be tested in some sense, right? Um, so then we, but, but reality is not that simple. So there, there will be then as next step problems with um, the source, the, the lens galaxy, which I have not, which you don't see in any of my plots. So there's always, it's always dark in the center, but usually there's a galaxy there that leaks over the rest. So this has to be included in the model. In the, analysis up to now uh, that are published, this is simply subtracted. So you fit this thing with, with, a, with a relatively simple analytical model, subtract it. This causes problems in the ring. This is not like a robust statistical method. It's something that you can do and that you have to quantify afterwards in terms of how, how much it affects your result. So we could do better there by taking this galaxy subtraction as part of the fit and maybe giving it more flexibility, flexibility with uh, 
as, as a Gaussian process, for instance, that we, where we can model more uncertainties that are probably there. We can also use multiple frequencies at the same time to disentangle red and, and blue galaxies, for instance. Um, if there are foreground contamination, we could basically use in our forward model just random realizations of foreground contamination to kind of marginalize over this foreground contamination as well in the second step. So all of these kind of tests have to have to be done, but I think they, they can be done easily, more easily in this context here, at least this is my hope, than in the traditional context, partially because this is like way faster, but also because, um, I mean, I haven't talked about how this is traditionally done, right? But those methods are also not like completely obvious, simple and clean. It's, uh, it's complicated machinery with lots of assumptions that have to be validated and so on and so forth. So I think what's nice here in some sense is that uh, all that beyond, we, we don't have to make too many additional assumptions. We have our forward model, which is relatively simple. It's just a Gaussian process for the source. And then we have actually machinery that tells us something about the best fit parameters plus correlations plus uncertainties, which is already better than what you get from traditional pipelines. And then we have the second step where we can marginalize easily over whatever uncertainties we can, can come up with quickly. So I think it gives more handles in some sense for, for confirming that things work. But I agree that since the methods themselves are quite new to most people or to basically everybody, uh, it requires some extra care, but um, that's, so that's about it. What will fully convince me is, uh, okay, if you make uh, uh, an estimation of the temperature of the, and you have a way of actually validating it in something completely independent. Uh, I don't know if that is possible, if there are any other sorts of observations that actually... Yes, fun, but they are not necessarily easier <laughs> to interpret. <laughs> yeah, but even, even if it's not easier, right? Let's no, say no, 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 but pipeline. I mean, yes, okay. I mean, there, there, there is like this aspect of being sure or robust or whatever with a given observation, but I agree. If, if you get a result here, uh, like, so there are two things, right? So if you can, if, if you basically start excluding cold dark matter because you don't see enough variation in the data, right? In some sense. I think that's easier to uh, convince people of than if you see uh, evidence against warm dark matter. Is this, maybe I'm saying this wrong. Let me think about what I'm saying. So the problem is it's easy to underestimate the structure in the image, right? And every additional source of structure can appear if you don't model it as subhalos. So it's easier to be, if, if, if the model is too simple to be biased to too much substructure, which gives you uh, too much evidence for cool dark matter. So, so that's something one has to be very uh, worried about. If you get evidence against cool dark matter, I think that would be much easier to uh, validate because it, it's hard to imagine effects, contamination of the image that make the image smoother than, than it appeared. Than it, than oh. it actually is. So that, that's one that's one piece, but I agree. I mean, robust detection would require other observables and there are other observables like stellar streams, uh, Lyman alpha forest observations. Um, that is, these are the two major things um, which are which have their own complexities and which also benefit from these kind of approaches um, in the end, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> Christopher, I have a, just, a, just a remark. On slide uh, 34, you show how you yep. train the network to recognize uh, true data model pairs from, uh, I, you, you just said scrambled ones. Um, you may possibly be able to speed up the network training substantially if you pick the examples um, from like uh, in a different way than just doing a pure scrambling. So that like um, during the training of the network, you start with arbitrary scrambled pairs and at some point, you, in, like in annealing or like in um, the selection of examples in triplet loss training, mm -hmm. you use these examples that are more and uh, closer and closer to the true model parameter, uh, parameter data pair, but still they are not the correct combinations. So you, you make the task harder and harder over time. You know what I mean? Yeah, that sounds interesting. I guess this would affect this equation here. I mean, in some, I, I guess it, yeah, it must have some impact on what the net, that the network afterwards wouldn't describe 
the the the, the um, likelihood ratio in that way, or a likelihood to, to evidence or posterior to prior, because you kind of in that process, I guess, would change the prior distribution and make it conditional on the data in some way. I, I mm -hmm. guess that's that right. Would, yeah, it would be interesting to see how this works out. I guess one can can correct for that. That sounds interesting. Do, do you know whether there is any? Is, is there like a uh, paper that I should look at where this is? This, maybe it's so standard that everybody knows it. Uh, I, th I know it's a it's a big um, it's a big topic um, in representation learning. How to mm -hmm. select the examples and counter examples when you want to make a good find a good representation. Yeah. Uh, for example, in triplet loss or other other loss uh, options there. Um, yeah, I should say that maybe we are doing something like that. And, and so I, mean, I didn't talk about SWIFT. So we um, that basically we introduced neural net, a new algorithm that we call neural nested posterior estimation. The basic idea is there, we start with relatively little training data and train an initial version of the posterior, which is conservative in the sense that it has too much. How, how would you say? It's too, it's too broad, so it has too high entropy. And then we use this to reduce the prior range to uh, so con get kind of a constraint prior. So, um, I think the good terminology for this for machine learning people is we, we multiply the prior with the indicator function that selects the, the region where the, pos where the posterior is expected to be large or significant. So we kind of zoom in the we, uh, into the prior space, which is relevant for a particular image, and then we generate more training data there. And uh, then we zoom in and zoom in. And at the end, we basically are with, with training data, with the training data, just in a range where we simply surround like the, the, um, the interesting, where, where we zoomed in into the interesting parameter range. And there in this region, I think all of the examples are very ad adversarial and some. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Yeah, that, that sounds similar. And, yeah, and, and you also don't have a uniform distribution of the examples, but, but the examples and counter examples are where you're interested. Yes, exactly. And the advantage here is that since the, we still draw from the prior, just a kind of constrained version of the prior, but, but within the constraints, it's still the prior, uh, the results are easy to interpret because, the, um, yeah, we still get the uh, posterior to prior range, uh, ratio just to a different prior. And um, so that solves the, solves the problem uh, of, of interpreting the results in, in, in various ways. Yeah. So for us, what this does, it allows us to use the same training data for training a large number of different marginals. So often you are not, so very, very often physicists like to look at plots like this, right? Maybe for 10 parameters. So you never look at the 10 dimensional <laughs> joint posterior because you can't, but you like to look at uh, one dimensional and two dimensional marginals in all their variations. So what uh, our code does is basically it provides a framework to easily train the 1D marginals and then also the 2D marginals on all in, in, in parallel uh, without ever going to, to high dimensions, uh, solving this joint, mar uh, joint posterior problem. And uh, so, so whatever, I mean, that, that, that's what we started doing. That, that seems to be useful. We haven't really applied this in that way for the lensing problem though. We, we know try to apply this to other problems. Christoph, I had one question. Um, it's uh, more about feature feature stuff. But so far, the results that you're showing were based upon um, a case in which you have a particular strong effect on the lensing from a particular point. And maybe this is what you and Luca were talking about earlier in terms of estimating the temperature. But surely, ultimately, you want the distribution um, of dark matter. Is that is that how do you see getting from where you are now to there? Because I understand that, of course, the dark matter also you expect it to be it's self-distributed in ways where it's localized, I assume. And that's why these localized uh, s uh, yeah. strong lensing effects are, are used. But um, yeah, I'm just curious, is that the direction you want to head in to eventually try to estimate the distribution of dark matter in within the lens or? or yeah, in some sense, yes. But uh, so our goal is not not anymore to actually model the distribution accurately uh, again, because it would be a, a very high dimensional complicated problem. 
um, in, in the sense that, I mean, you could imagine you model the dark matter distribution also as a Gaussian process or something like this. Mm -hmm. you, you get very complicated long range correlations and all kinds of things. So, so it would be first very hard to get the posterior, in that case, high dimensional joint posterior, right? And then it would be very hard to interpret in terms of any uh, interesting physics, uh, particle okay. physics aspects. So uh, our goal is right now simply to, to get uh, the marginal posterior, either for like single subhalos or uh, uh, on top of other structure in the dark matter halo, or in terms of population parameters. And there, the way we will generate training data is simply that we generate uh, the, the mainlands, the, the source randomly, and then randomly distributed substructure, either with a lot of uh, lighter halos or without lighter halos. And then we see if the network when right, the network is, can pick up. Yeah. Right, which is kind of like doing a diff different temperature ranges, right? By uh, having lighter, many lighter or not. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. This, this would directly tra translate into temperature. And we have like a, a physics, uh, I mean, there, there, there's, we have a physics prior for that from embody simulations that we can use as, as, as okay. Thanks want... so much, I've got to run. So I'm gonna just disappear, but thank you so much for the talk. Okay. okay. I wonder if the Gaussian process approach, I, it sounds quite attractive to me too, because uh, if you actually, if you have a statistical model of dark matter, which I'm sure you do, then as far as you can linearize it, actually you can have a ad hoc covariance function that is function of the temperature and it will predict the stance of correlations uh, because the, the temperature will basically affect the GP covariance function. And then if you marginalize out the, the actual dark matter distribution, then you have a very clear uh, posterior over the temperature itself. Yeah, but it wouldn't be Gaussian uh, at all, I think. It, I mean, the, the way th this usually looks like, or to, to visualize this, maybe you have an extremely peaked halo. So, so you usually, I mean, a halo is not something that looks at all like a Gaussian. It's more something that, that looks like an inverse power law. So typically you have a dark matter density that increases extremely drastically towards the center of that halo. And so, so more like a, think about this like as a, as a discrete point with a extreme tail or whatever. I, I don't yeah, know, but like a Cauchy distribution, whatever. So something horrible. And then you have many, many of these things on top of each other. So you would have, you would have a dark, the dark matter halo, the main lens, plus lots of additional small halos that all would have the same very peaked structure, but also very large tail in the distribution. And so if you think about modeling this with the Gaussian process, uh, you, you would just get these these little peaked features wrong, um, and I also think you're a bit confusing. To the, the, may, may, maybe yeah. I think you're confusing a bit the covariance because those peak features come simply from the covariance of the Gaussian process. The the Gaussian part is the statistical fluctuation term, which I get it is not necessarily Gaussian, but it's not about the spatial behavior. The spatial behavior can be bundled. Yeah, that's true. But um, then still locally, you would expect that it's. Let, let me think about this now. Um, okay, so, so the way I think about this is um, a good model for the distribution of halos is a uh, point source. So imagine you have a, a sky with, with gamma, in my mind, these are gamma ray sources, whatever. They would appear after you apply the instrumental PSF, uh, point spread function, as, as little Gaussian blobs. And then you typically, a typical image would be like you have a huge number of pixels, let's say a thousand by a thousand, and you have then um, in a tiny subset of these pixels, point sources distributed. So that there would be, if you look at the image, it's just the image. I mean, it, it looks like the sky, right? A bunch of sources. I, I guess you wouldn't, would you model the, the starlight from the sky as a Gaussian process? I mean, if you can do that, so it, then. I think it's that big because, so you do think that it's no, in that case, but in that case, you, you can probably do something similar with a point process, so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, statistically, it's much more like a point process, but the points would be then distributed quite wide, broadly. Okay, I, I was, I had more of the kind of CMB. Oh, no, 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 it's, like it's, a, it's, yeah, it's which... kind of the opposite extreme. Uh, the, it's, it's probably more like a, like a point process, and then you start okay. there. Point process uh, convolved with an extremely peaked kernel, if this makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah, indeed, and of course, it's highly non-Gaussian. Yeah, that, that makes it hard, but still, I think it would be cool to have a have a better. So one of the things we do right now is we try to see if we can 
build a probabilistic model for then this is what we discussed right so a probabilistic model for the distribution of dark matter halos which is simply a probabilistic model that tells you like given that there is a large halo here uh, there's certain probability that you have smaller halos nearby you can randomly draw from this i guess this behaves not like it's not behaving like a Gaussian process, but it gives you some probabilistic model. And then we try to fit this to embody simulation results to see if we can get the, the details of the model, right? The mass function, the, the distribution of it. That's that's just starting now, but um, if, if this would work, one could try, one could have a probabilistic model, more realistic probabilistic model than what we have right now for the dark matter, for the main lens and use this in the fit. That would be pretty useful. Uh, directly based on on fits of that model to embody simulations. So, but th there isn't a simple thermodynamic model of the because I was kind of assuming that actually you can actually have a simple kind of equilibrium model of how it should behave as function of the temperature. But I guess it's a no, I no, mean, no, no, no. It's it's way way more. Um, it's not necessarily complicated. The physics behind this is ra relatively simple because. It's, it's just gravity in some sense, Newton gravity. But um, you have to, I think there's no good way around just simulating how structure forms. Because in the end, if you look, in the end, uh, it, the, all these structures that form are not isolated. So what th things that matter are, for instance, some of the structure forms early on, but then falls into larger halos. In the process, you have tidal forces that maybe rip part of, of those things that fall in away and redistribute and then the main halo and stuff. Stuff like that. So all these effects play a role and they are not easy to, to model from first principles. Although there are, there are analytic models, but they are also, they are always calibrated against the numerical simulation results. So, but theoretically the analytic model could be used for... Uh... Yeah, I mean, we use, we use right now analytic models, basically an analytic model that is, is fit to numerical simulation results in some sense or motivated. It's, I mean, the, the thing that we use right now is relative, relatively simple. It's just inverse power law, which is kind of elliptical. So it's not entirely spherical. And there are a bunch of free parameters like the position, the overall normalization, the slope of the power law, the orientation of the ellipse and uh, ellipticity. Um, and maybe I'm missing a few parameters, but, but those are, so the, the main lens model right now is rather simple. Okay. And, and our, our strategy for making it slightly more complicated, which already in the literature, I think people, I mean, yeah, so I think we have to make it more complicated because in reality, halos don't look that, that simple. So there are distortions around that. Uh, one thing we wanted to try at some point is to multiply a Gaussian process on top of that, uh, something like this, so that we can model small variations around that mean or average behavior and take this into account. Mm -hmm. um, in the literature, people use other approaches like uh, pixelization, so similar approaches in some sense. So basically, a lot the the dark matter density that, that is modeled in the main lens to vary more or less randomly in each pixel of the image. So it's kind of a pixelated uh, model for for the dark matter density. Yeah, so the non-stationary non -stationary Gaussian process one for each halo sounds actually quite elegant. Uh... If you multiply it to this thing, yeah, I, I think this. Yeah, or just uh, the covariance function can be not, yeah, exactly, can be multiplied by the, by a... Yeah, we, we have to see what works. Um, and yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. It was uh, really fascinating. Say that. Uh, yes, okay. And uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, for coming uh, and for a beautiful presentation. Thanks bye so bye. Much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye.